ask if you'd be engaged to engage in purity with me. I'd be honored to be engaged to engage in purity with you. And while we're apart, these purity rings will be a semi-binding reminder of our limited commitment to each other. <laughs> That's confusing, but cute, but also really dumb. When temptation hits, what are those rings going to do? They're a symbol of our... <laughs> this is a symbol, honey. Those are finger decoration. Wait. What you need is an ironclad chastity safeguard, what we like to call purity ring. 3,000. Symbols and promises are great if you're a cartoon monkey living in a coloring book in the 1600s. But today, in the real world, what you need is something with a little more oomph. The Purity Ring 3000 isn't just a ring. It's a fully automated personal chastity defense system. <laughs> it comes embedded with a GPS tracker that lets someone keep tabs on you at all times. She's on the move. It's 9 a.m. She's probably on the way to class. No time. Go, 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 go. It is also preloaded with Abstin Incense, proprietary scientifically formulated scent that is automatically emitted if too many pheromones of the opposite sex are detected in the air. Oh, it's not me. It's the purity ring. Oh, 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 oh. You don't care about that. When the ring detects an increase in heart rate due to an inappropriate desire, it triggers an ear-piercing alarm and blinding strobe light. And if you're lecherous enough to actually make physical contact, the Purity Ring 3000 immediately kills the nearest fuzzy animal. <laughs> Is this what you wanted? Yes. <laughs> and if things really get bad, the Purity Ring 3000 kicks into full chastity lockdown mode, projecting a pre-recorded image of your mother staring at you in disappointment. Try compromising your virtue with dear old mom looking back at you. Didn't think so. Why leave your honor and integrity to chance? Don't trust your virtue to a silly old-fashioned piece of scrap metal. And trust it, the purity ring 3000. Promises are nice, boundaries are great. But if you really want to remain virtuous, you need a ring that shoots a The Purity ring 3000. Not meant as a replacement to actual self-control, boundaries, and good decision-making. All right, so today we're going to talk about teenagers, which means that we have to have the sex talk. Are you ready? Yeah, neither were my kids. <laughs> You know, that's kind of the way that we frame it of going, oh, you know what? Oh, we got teenagers now, so, you know, I got to talk about this, and I got to talk about that, and I got to talk about this. And we got a whole list of lectures that we want to go, well, now you need to know, and I need to let you know. And that goes over like a lead balloon, right? It doesn't really help uh, at all. It's not, the, it's not the thing. And what we tend to kind of start to imagine uh, raising teenagers to be like is this kind of crazy world of going, okay, there's a lot of yelling and screaming and tears and battles of the will. And, and I, I, I believe it because I saw it. I, I grew up in that. I'm the youngest. So my brother and sister, man, they went through every landmine. I mean, they were going out there going, where's the landmines at? They blew, I take, took notes going, yeah, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I had my own issues, but I had the benefit of going, I'm not doing a whole host of things because I see where that went to, right? But raising teenagers is kind of tough. When we had four little ones out in California, we started doing the math, which we probably should have done ahead of time. Um, and we're like, you know what this means, having four babies in three and a half years with no twins, is, is that we're going to have four teenagers like for a significant amount of time. Like, Are we going to survive that? Fortunately, there was a couple out there, really wonderful couple that belonged to our church, the Kells. They had, uh, they had, I think, three teenagers at the same time that were all kind of, you know, it wasn't a disaster. It wasn't uh, a hair pulling out uh, trauma type of thing of going, okay, you know what? They, they, they were pretty steady and stable, and it, it gave us hope of going, you know what? We, we would tell them, we're going to call you in about 15 years here and, and get your advice of kind of how you did this, but... Uh, now we're in the, in the heart of it, in the midst of it. We've got the four teenagers, and, and uh, 
it's not quite this bad, but this is the way that we often imagine it, that it is going to be the worst. It's going to be terrible. So to help us deal with this, we need to go back to the ancient theologians, Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, they're going to help us here. So uh, Calvin says, for school, we're supposed to write a paragraph about what our dads do. Dad the paragraph. Catchy title, huh? What does my dad do? Mostly he gets on my nerves. The end. <laughs> you may get a point for succinctness. What else is there to say? Now, Calvin's a little kid in this, but this is like perfect teenagehood, right? You know, uh, I wear this badge proudly of going, I have now become the irritant and the embarrassment. And often said in my car, it's like, Dad, don't ever say that again. You know, st just stop. Just stop. Don't say that. I was going to wear skinny jeans today, but then I realized the first, I don't match the first requirement. <laughs> so that didn't happen. Right? You know, there's this kind of, uh, uh, when, when the kids are small, like, I'm the superhero. You know, dad can do anything. It's awesome. And then suddenly something happens where it's like, oh, dad, oh, my goodness, I can't believe it. At least I don't cry in church. These are the jokes, folks. <laughs> well, a book that I'm basing uh, this, uh, this part of our series off of uh, by um, Paul Tripp. He talks about the age of opportunity. He says, we've got this all wrong. So I'm going to read the whole quote. Part of the quote is going to be up here on the screen for us. He says, it is time for us to reject the wholesale cynicism of our culture regarding adolescence. Rather than years of undirected and unproductive struggle, these are years of unprecedented opportunity. They are the golden age of parenting, when you begin to reap all the seeds you have sown in their lives, when you can help your teenager to internalize truth, preparing him or her for a productive, God-honoring life as an adult. That's quite a turn there to go from, this is just something I want to get through and get, get over, to going, hey, this is something that is an unprecedented opportunity we need to stop viewing this as going, this is the problem years. This is when it's going to be awful. This is when it's going to just be terrible. And I just hope we kind of make it through to going, he is inviting us to this place of going, no, no, this is, this can be the best. Are there struggles? Are there challenges? Absolutely. But in those challenges, there is great opportunity. So uh, uh, one of the reasons why we kind of struggle with this, why we kind of have this locked in our mind, is because of a shift that happens. So last week we talked about kids, but I have a graph for you because I like graphs, just like my daughter. We like graphs. Graphs show us the truth. This is a graph that's going to show you very handily what's going on here. This is about power and control. The parents are blue. At, when they're little, they're in full control, full power. Beck doesn't give any problem to his parents. They, he does exactly what they do to him, right? He doesn't wander off. He doesn't say no. He just get, he cries and gets fed and is happy. He has zero power. He's yellow. And as it goes along, there's this growing sense of as the child gets to have more and more power, the parents have less and less power. Suddenly they're walking, now you're chasing, and suddenly they're climbing, and now you're like, yeah, get down from there, right? And then you hit this magical spot where you start to share power, and you start to sense this growing mo moment, momentum of that they are more and more in control and you are less and less in control. And we look at this and we go, see, this is why teenage adolescence is so terrible. We are more and more out of control. If I could just figure out how to control my teenagers, it would all be okay. And we look at this and go, see, this is what the problem is. But this graph is showing you everything that is right. 
this graph is right. Our job as parents is not to have controlled our children to the day that they leave our home and go, whew, all right, I never lost control. But to usher our children to the place where as they head out, they are in full control of themselves. We're not in control of them, but we hand them out as adults. And Paul Tripp is inviting us into this journey of going, yes, when we start to feel like we have less control, it's not a time of terror, it's a time of unprecedented opportunity. Because now we have more to work with. There are challenges, but you get the job of influencing in this critical juncture when they start taking on more and more responsibility, when they start to answer deeper questions about themselves and about the world, This is exactly right. And what we need to do is know how to negotiate that time period. You see that? The Bible doesn't talk about what we're supposed to do with teenagers. Because it doesn't believe in them. No. Adolescence is something we created in the last 100, 150 years. So you're not going to find that word or that concept in there. But you'll find in Scripture lots of places where parents are giving not just kind of a, don't do this, stay in the yard, don't hit your sister, but this deeper truth, right? So Proverbs is a great place for this, the first several chapters of it. Proverbs 3, 1 says, my son, do not forget my teaching and keep my commands in your heart. Yeah, we talked about that last week, right? We often want to deal with the surface behavior. Issues, scripture is always going, no, no, you've got to you gotta drill down to the heart. The heart is what matters. And here he's going, look, it's not just about my teaching, but I'm talking about the stuff that gets deep inside. Who is what what is shaping and forming you? I implore you, don't forget what, what your mom and I have taught you and have showed you. For if you stay to them, they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace, prosperity. We have shown you the right way. That's our job. Not to control. Even this has this future-looking part to this verse. Can't you see it? If you do this, it sets you up for a good life. It's not not an absolute promise as much as it is saying this is a general trend. When you live right before God, as we have shown you, Good things are ahead. So Paul Tripp says, look, these unprecedented opportunities come in kind of three different categories. Let's just talk about those real quick here. He says, one is the opportunity of insecurity. Do you remember what it was like being a teenager? It was awful. At least it was for me. You couldn't pay me enough money to go back and be a teenager. I was a late bloomer, like college kind of like finally baked me. If you'd have saw me in high school, everybody would go, yee, that's not so good, right? I remind my kids, I sat at the reject table, not with my friends. That's not why we sat together. It's just because we were all the reject people and no one else would sit with us. So we only sat with one another. It was rough because all of this insecurity... It's, it's way beyond what an eight-year-old, a happy-go-lucky kind of, you know, I just want a friend and I want to play and I want to have fun. And that, that's the deepest question that they ten- generally have. You come into this teenage and suddenly I'm trying to figure out who I am and my body is changing and weird things are happening and I get pimples. And now I got all these complex relationships now and they play all these games and how am I going to negotiate that? It is tough being a teenager. I don't care what time frame that you live in. Things are constantly changing. And I'm telling you, if you're a teenager, all of us adults are just going, we are glad we are past that, right? But for us parents, this creates an opportunity that as they struggle with this and they ask those deeper questions, for us to step into those moments So he uh, told a story that I can't relate to at all. He's kind of a pastor type fella. And so he had done a full day of ministry. I think he had taught at a seminar. He had done some counseling that day. 
And he was coming home, and he, said, he admitted, he was like, my only hope was that my whole family was asleep. And I could just get some dinner, sit down with the TV remote, and be left alone. That was my dream. I can't relate to this at all. You know, I'm out of words. I don't want to talk to anybody else, right? I'm spent. I've done ministry. I, I don't have anything left. But he came home, and that was not true for him. In fact, his youngest son had had a major fight with his, the older brother. And uh, it turns out it was over something very petty. So I wanted him to do Noel's wisdom. Get a grip. Get over it. Leave me alone. Right? I'm tired. I'm not even going to, I'm not going to, if it was something big and significant, maybe I'll do it because I've got to do it. I'm dad. But you know what? Get a grip. Get over it. He wanted to do that too. But he recognized the opportunity, even for a petty thing. And so he sat down with his son and let him kind of, you know, pour out his complaint and this is what happened. And then he stepped into that. Rather than just kind of resolving it, settling it, getting past it, he helped his son start to process that. What, what happened and what's going on and how are you going to deal with that? And what does this say about you and what, in terms of how you react to this? And over the course of that time, he went. this conversation went way beyond this little petty matter. And help my son to begin to understand, okay, this is how I'm going to handle conflict. This is my role in these type of situations. So that he could set up his son to be able to handle conflict. Which is totally irrelevant because we are a country that really readily understands how to handle uh, conflict and, and being offended. I mean, we, we all just kind of let it roll right off our backs, right? Nobody carries around grudges at all, do we? He saw that opportunity in this insecure moment over a stupid, petty thing and went to a deeper conversation. Now, if you'd lined up a nice lecture, you know, the sex talk and, or the, the offense talk, I'm sure that would have went over well. But he saw the opportunity and stepped into it, didn't he? He also talks about the opportunity of rebellion. What? No, no, that's what's wrong with that. See, this is, this is the hair pulling out part, right? The attitude, the pushback, the, the defiance, the, the sneaking around, the lying, the conniving. I can't stand it type of a thing. If I could just control them, if they would just obey me like they did when they were little kids. He goes, instead of pulling out our hairs, we need to see that this is an opportunity. Because this is part of their natural development. They must push back against you. They're trying to figure some things out. It's not as an excuse for especially bad behavior, but we recognize that this is not an aberration, that this is part of their development. They're going to push back. They're going to test boundaries. They're going to cross some lines. And we as parents need to have the wisdom to go, you know what? I'm not going to be personally offended on this. I'm going to step where I am as a parent and go, this is an opportunity for us to talk about authority, to talk about boundaries, to talk about sin. And when I you know, want to desire the wrong thing, how do I deal with that? This can lead to some seriously great conversations. How about when your child lies to you? Instead of just kind of dropping the hammer and going, you'll never lie to me again, how can we trust you? Do you understand the consequences of that lie? That now there are things that I can't trust you with. It's not a scolding as much as a, these are the real world consequences of that and helping them to come to terms with this. Rebellion's not a problem. It's an opportunity. Or how about the opportunity of the expanding world? This one terrifies me. You know, we had a nice little safe world when I was growing up. My kids now have access to things that I can't even imagine. Good things, bad things. And you know what? I could go, you don't really live in that world, and I could keep you in this little nutshell. But it's just not true. Because I don't know where this culture is going. I don't know where the technology is going. 
They have to be ready to live in the reality that they are. And their world is expanding faster than what I've ever experienced. Now, I could be all fretted about that. Or I can recognize this is an opportunity. As they encounter things, that's going to raise questions. As they wrestle with technology, that's going to raise questions. I've drawn lines in the sand for myself. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going there. I'm not going to be a texter. You texters. I can't believe that. No. You know, I, I'm not going there, but it's totally reasonable for them. That's, that's their world. That's all right. It's not a bad or good or bad choice, but how do you handle that? I should be involved in those. I should see those opportunities. Or when I came home and they were little kids, what? They were waiting for dad to come home. And like, I think that's one of God's graces. It, it's just such an ego boost to show up. Yeah, dad's home. We're going to go out the yard. We're going to throw the football. Like, I'm the center of their world, right? Like, good things happen when I show up. Now it's like they're going and doing this and that, and I'm no longer the center of their world. It's a little bit sad. It's kind of, oh, I've lost some things. But I want to understand the opportunity of going, but look at what, how they're growing and what they're experiencing because that's where they're headed. And I want to recognize that opportunity and be part of that as they wrestle with different situations and they come back and go, okay, how do I figure this out? How do I make sense of this? These are all opportunities for us as parents to be engaging our kids helping them along as our power is decreasing. We could fight against it and go, no, I'm going to control you. I'm going to try and make this as less, the least painful for me as possible. Or we can go, you know what? It's a, it's, it's a wild and crazy world. God's given me the privilege of walking along with you to figure this out. And the goal is not to get my children to make my decisions. That's a hard one. My goal is not to get my children to make the decisions I would make for them. They are not robots. We've said this over and over. This is not a computer program. They are going to make their own choices. They're going to encounter things that I'm never going to encounter or never had to wrestle with. They're going to also face some things that I have had to encounter and wrestle with. And I can share that with them. But it is to get them to the place where they're ready to make those decisions and live with the consequences of those. Well, let's think about it in a different way. There is another rite of passage in teenagehood. It is called learning how to drive. Right? When kids are small... And you get them in the van, whose hands are on the steering wheel? Papa. Right? I can keep them safe. I'm going to get them where they need to go. i got to handle some squabbling. Quiet down. Don't make me pull this van over. Quit hitting your sister. You know, those type of things. But I know that things are going to go kind of the way that I intend because I'm in control. And I'm going to get them where they need to go. But then we cross that line... And there comes that fateful day at 16 that I have to do this, right? And they put their own hands on the wheel. And the terrible thing is that God has ordained from the foundation of the earth that I must sit in the seat next to them without my hands on the wheel, right? It's not just that they get to grab the wheel and go where they want to. I've got to experience this, right? It's terrifying, you know, this kid used to ride bikes into, into trees, and now he's driving? What are you talking about? But that's the moment. That's the opportunity, isn't it? If I went, no, no, I want to keep you safe. No, I, I know how to drive. I'll, I'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. I would be harming my child, wouldn't I? My goal is to hand off the steering wheel. And to be a guide, helping them to learn how to handle this terrible responsibility that can have some devastating consequences and incredible blessings. 
of being able to control where you go. And so I sit in the seat next to them, not with my hand over here, pretending, right? Every once in a while, I might have to reach over and go, let's not hit that tree, (laughs) right? But in general, I only have my words. Okay, we're going down here. Now, I'm not reciting kind of the, the rules of the road. You know, they need to know that. But I have my own laws. Uh, Katie's not here. Who's here? Has Ben here? Ben, what's the first rule of driving? Right. It is not obey the laws. Don't hit anything. Because even if you did everything right and obeyed all the rules and then you hit something, you've already done something wrong. Because you've got to deal with insurance and that's all wrong. There's no winners in that. Right? Don't hit anything. And so you learn the rules of the road, but I hope that I teach them more than that, right? It's not just kind of going, okay, I got to stay in my own lane. I, you know, I'm only allowed to go 35. We're coming up on parked cars. What, can you imagine someone darting out? Can you see this situation? What hazard's coming up? There's no rule on that. It's about this larger awareness, isn't it? Going out on the highway. What are the rules there? It's more than just stay in your lane. It's about being stable and predictable. Things happen fast. It's actually easier driving because everything's straighter. But bad things happen in a split second because you're moving so fast. And so you want to be stable and predictable. One of the, Ben's first long-term drives on 80, we we're going out to Grandma. And we did it on Sunday. So that meant 10 minutes into the, into the ride, I fell asleep. And uh, I'd kind of wake up. I'm still alive. You doing okay? All right, we're good. And I'd fall right back to sleep. Now, one of those times I woke up and Ben had decided to pass a semi truck. And that's good. I'm, I'm glad he took on that challenge, with, even without, without me being conscious of it. The, the only issue is that if I had rolled down my window, I could have padded the, the bumper <laughs> of the truck. Now, imagine if I had gone, oh my goodness, I did it! You know, you know, he gets all nervous. That would have been terrible. I think I calmly, still half asleep, went, I think you should give this guy a little more room. <laughs> let's, let's just go over this way a little bit, right? Because I can't steal it out of his hands. I got to trust him. I've got to take on my responsibility of going, I get to, I get to show you the way. I get to give, get to give you some influence. You're going to be responsible as you take this wheel, especially after 18, you're responsible for it all, for every choice. I can't control that. But what I can do is give you some wisdom. And that's what Paul, Paul Tripp is going. He's going, one of the major goals is to develop a heart of conviction and wisdom in our teens in life. It's not just about behavior or controlling we were, you know, we started this process when they were, when they were younger, right? That's what, what we talked about last week of going. It's not just about controlling behavior. It's about getting to the heart of it. Well, the, the game just ups it, its ante as they get into teenage. Now it's all about the heart. It's all about what's inside. What are your convictions? And I need to model as well as speak. This is who I am. This is how I live my life. This is what I recommend for you. Who, who are you going to be? What will you go, I'm definitely going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Those convictions. But it's also about this wisdom. Wisdom is way deeper than just a list of rules. A list of beliefs. Beliefs and rules are important and they have their place. But wisdom goes way deeper. It's those situations and scenarios that I can never imagine. But that, that sense and awareness of going as I approach a situation that I've never talked about, he knows how to handle it. That's what Proverbs talks about. My son, do not let wisdom and understanding out of your sight. Keep sound judgment and discretion. That's what we're aiming for. See, that discretion isn't a list of rules. Discretion is this deep sense of going 
you know what? I know how to handle situations. And my kids are going to mess up. They're going to make mistakes. It's okay. I made my mistakes. I'm going to love you through yours. I hope you learn through them. I hope that I've given you the guidance to avoid some of this stuff. I'm not going to charge you as wrong because you've messed up. Let's, let's learn and go on from here. It's powerful. And when they, when they grab hold of that, when, when we step into that as parents and pass that on, that will then be life for them, an ornament of grace around your neck. You will go on your way in safety and your foot will not stumble for the Lord will be at your side and will keep your foot from being snared. By the way, that's not an absolute promise. That's not how Proverbs works. It's talking about this general principle of going when we teach our kids wisdom, when we empower them and show them the right way. If they embrace that way and they embrace the faith and they have their own relationship with God, not on my coattails, not on yours, but they walk with God. Good things are ahead for them. Right? One last thing on this topic, because I hear all the time, is, well, what about church and my teenagers? You know, they're, you know, they're starting to gain that power, and they don't want to come. Do I force them to come? I don't want to force them to come, and them hate it. You know, what about my teenager in church? I would remind you of Joshua. Remember how we started this off? As for me and my house, if he had only meant for him, Joshua could have said, as for me, I will serve the Lord. But he stepped up, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Until they're to the 18, you have some authority. It's waning as time goes along. The things that you used early don't work as much. But you and your spouse, you get to determine this is who we are as a household. We serve the Lord, and this is what it means to be in this house. You will need to decide for yourself. I understand that. And that day will come. But that day is not today. You're part of this family. You're part of this house. And this is what we do. Now please understand me. I'm not talking about a power move. Although this is an authority move. But it's not just a power move. One of the things I've learned from uh, the bakers as they've, they've gone through this phase. You know what studies have found? Is that as your children grow older, they will go through a phase that when they are seeking life, wisdom, some advice, they're probably not going to go to you. You know, they're still trying to kind of separate themselves, distance them, they're trying to figure out. But you know who they will go to? They will go to your trusted friends they've seen you do that when you bring your children into the community of faith you are giving them a precious gift of a community they may not understand that now at 13 or 15 but in due time they will understand that and they will act on it and they will pull from these good people people that we desire to follow God Give your children this gift of community. It's not just about forcing your kids to do something. You can't force faith. We get that. That's not what that's about. But it's your identity as a home, and it's all the godly benefits of being part of a faith community. Don't rob them of that. Set the course. As for me and my house, we serve the Lord. Your day will come for you to decide for your house. So, you know, this is a quick overview, but this is why we're offering these classes. You know, the Apologetics one in particular, that's very relevant for if you have teenagers. Man, they are awash in this stuff of truth and error and what to believe. So I would highly recommend being part of that. But we've got to step up, parents. Not control our children but guide them. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of, of 
these teenagers that you've put into our hands, into our life. Let us not squander it or misunderstand it or look past it, but to embrace the opportunities, the special, unique opportunities this time frame uh, uh, means. Give us the wisdom as parents not to just cling or to control, but to guide. We need your help in our life. Help us to set the course, set the model, set the example for our children. They will decide, but today we decide on the model. And let us serve you.